This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 961, recorded on Wednesday, February 21st, 2024. This is possible thanks to a virus. Hey, everyone. I'm Dr. Kiki. And tonight on This Week in Science, we will fill your heads with ADHD, bowls, and propagandist AI. But first, thanks to our amazing Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twists. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following program is for anyone interested in the world around them. The history, the future, the inner workings of complicated things. This is a place for the curious, the clever, and the ever-restless mind. A sanctuary of reason, a walled garden of delightful thoughts, an ivory tower of intellectually intrepid thinking. From here, you can see it all. Above the clouds, below the ground, everything in between, everything beyond. Eliminating the unreal to reveal the real, the actual, the true, the verifiable. The ultimate mirror of existence reflected off the unbiased surface of scientific method. It is time once again to talk about everything that is going on. This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. And a good science to you too, Justin, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about things, stuff, you know, whatevs. Oh, Justin's leaving. Science! We're here to talk about science as we are every week. Oh, If you are curious about the world, if you want to find a place where we're not just going to give you the pat answers and just whatever it is, we're going to make you think, we're going to give you a little uncertainty, we're going to give you questions. That's what this show is about. We, we, We want you to like get those brain muscles exercising, you know, because, you know, they, they exercise. Not enough in the world, but I know this audience has big brain muscles. I have stories this week about uh, Saturn, well, a planet and not a planet. I've got also bulls and balls, propagandist AI, and some brain news. What do you have, Justin? Oh, what have I got? Uh, I've got ADHD. And mm. have had it Me. perhaps since the beginning of humanity. Uh, <laughs> let's see. There is oh oh a question. Is it even okay to be publishing Chinese research? A Danish bog body has begun to tell its own story. Dead men tell no tales. Except for this one. This one's yeah. really blabbering on and on. And uh <laughs> Some German linguistics uh, prof- uh, professors looked at the the numerous ways in which uh, Americans uh, communicate getting drunk. Communicate getting drunk. Uh huh. Like the words used for or uh, look, I can't wait to find out what you mean by communication here. Yeah. <sighs> How do I let you know? Communicate. Let's get smashed, hammered, whatever. That's like this story right there. Okay. You get, it's totally this get gazeboed. What? Basically, I was just yeah. do this story now. No, basically, we're gonna, we're, no, you you teased it. We're going to basically get to it when you get to it because that'll be fun. First, I need to tell everybody that this is a weekly podcast. We broadcast live on Facebook. 
Twitch, and YouTube, 8 p.m. Pacific time-ish. Uh, and you can subscribe to us there, get notifications when we go live. You can also find us as a podcast. Most places podcasts are found. Again, this week in science, we're also known as TWIS. And if this is just a lot of stuff to remember, go to our website, twistwis.org. Org, and you can find our show notes, links to stories, all sorts of other stuff, links to the podcast episodes. Uh, but it's time for the science right now. Yeah. Let me introduce the first story to the show tonight. Life and Saturn. Well, Saturn itself, the planet, we don't, yeah, we don't really think of Saturn, gas giant with rings as a place that is hospitable to life but many researchers through the years have been like the moons the moons of these gas giants perhaps as they're covered in ice and contain these liquidy mantle center i don't know un crust ice encrusted uh oceans of whatever uh, maybe there's life under the ice and we crashed the huygens probe many years ago with the uh, cassini mission to huygens. saturn into Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. And we were, we've also taken many looks at it and we're like, oh my gosh, Titan, it's got a subsurface ocean and look at the surface. It's got like mountainy things and valleys and oh, it looks like it's great. And oh, it's got all sorts of carbon, organic molecules on the surface. Oh, amazing. And so from there, everybody like, you know, just speculated like, well, there's so much organic material on the surface of Saturn, then uh, not Saturn on, on the surface of Titan. Well, then, of course, of course, there must be a whole bunch of uh, uh, organic material under that crust and within its interior oceans. Well, a new study out of uh, a new study out this last week has determined that it's very unlikely, actually, that there's much life underneath the crust. And wait, it, wait, wait. Now, when you say we're, it's unlikely that there's much life, or, that means there could be a little life. This is, this is, it could be a little. This, okay, so I went, hmm, the surface is covered, covered in organic material. And, oh, hey, these meteors come around occasionally and come and yeah. crash the surface and boom, they crash in the surface and wherever they hit, hit it heats up and then there's little melty stuffs and oh well wouldn't that melty stuff have like sunk down and gotten incorporated into that subsurface ocean and anyway they decided that based on the number of impacts that could have happened uh the, the amount of organic material that's on the surface and the melt rate ending melting down into the ocean i rate uh they, they they decided that uh, the quote the quote is there's about one elephant's worth of organic material in the in, entire volume of that ocean under the uh, under Titan's surface. So you heard it uh, here first, folks. Yeah. There's an elephant on Titan. It's not an elephant. That's what one, I heard. Well, one. It's the, approximately the same mass as a male African elephant. And if you find glycine. one elephant, you know, there's probably two or three more living in the walls. Yeah. One of the most basic amino acids, glycine, there's no more than about one male African elephant in that giant subsurface ocean, which is much, much larger than the volume of Earth's ocean overall. And so... One elephant in an ocean is not enough to sustain life, according to the lead author of this uh, paper published in Astrobiology, uh, Catherine Neisch out of Western University. But then, okay, but if the idea, though, is that this organic material got maybe deposited there? Yes. Then where did it come from? Is there just organic material floating around on on comets and asteroids floating around in our uh, solar system? Yes. And so the the, the issue is, oh. 
the transfer of the carbon from those asteroids and comets to the surface of these icy moons and then into their subsurface oceans. So how do you make it all happen in the right way? Uh, the team and their research, they uh, suggest that it is very likely that none of the icy moons around uh, Jupiter or Saturn, uh, Uranus, Neptune could potentially host life. That this, this uh, possibility of reduced movement of organic matter from the surface into their oceans isn't sufficient and isn't going to work. So um, the question is, is Titan unique in the fact that it's covered in organic material or is it just the outlier in that other icy moons are more likely to have incorporated the carbon-based molecules into their uh, oceans? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But anyway, they're going to go look at it. They have a dragonfly mission, and uh, this researcher, Dr. Neish, is involved in the dragonfly mission from NASA, which is going to be going out about 2028, and it'll be studying prebiotic chemistry on, the, uh, on, on Titan. They'll see. They'll go. Mm. They'll sample. They'll see what's happening. And let us know what's going on. Stay tuned. We'll have an update Stay in tuned. four years. And in four five, years. six. How long does it take to get there once they launch? It was like, what was it, like 13 <clears throat> years? Oh, gosh. No. Something like that. Yeah, I don't it's know. Be a while. It's a long time. Anyway, um, it'll be a little bit of what? A little bit of travel time. Um, the other Saturn I wanted to talk about is a process, it's a, a deep learning process. Call that they that researchers publishing in Nature Methods this last week. They they did preprints last year. Uh, the Saturn stands for Species Alignment Through Unification of RNA and Proteins. It's a deep learning approach, and what they're doing is taking RNA sequencing. Uh, so taking uh, these gene expression of RNA, and also protein sequences of known proteins, correlating them with given weights to like what the proteins actually do and their functions, and creating a database that puts together everything so that we finally will not just have like, oh, look, we've got genomes for fish, genomes for birds, genomes for all these different species, but actually starting to put the gene to the protein to the function and be able to get that homologous cell function across species. And so in doing their, uh, the, the work that they've published, they've shown that um, there are a lot of protein types that are related but have moved on or gene types that, have, that are related that have moved on to different cell types and different places in uh, different organisms throughout evolution. On the other hand, they've also shown that there are lots of proteins that might kind of be different in different species, but they have these similar functions. And so they're grouped together based on their, their function. And I, I know we've talked about um, hormones and other active molecules that are named differently in different species because they've been studied for different things that then they turn out to have the same function, but they're slightly different in their form. But now this is a, an effort to kind of put all of it together into us into an atlas using RNA, protein sequencing, and protein function. And they've uh, come up with uh, what they call macro genes, which is basically like genes that are all kind of might be found different places, but they all kind of are in charge of the same kind of things. Um, but the whole, uh, the emphasis of this is to see really how much change has happened from throughout evolution from mm. species to species to species. Very cool. This yeah. is, this is pretty, this is pretty exciting because this could be another, uh, another way of, finding interrelatedness if we've somehow missed it in the genome 
finding exactly. proteins that are doing similar functions might might give a might give a hint. Although it should kind of be there in the DNA. Also, there, there's also some. Uh, I think we already talked about it on the show. Uh, but AI that is uh, starting with function uh, and working backwards to create the protein. We've uh, we've for a long time been you know sort of right, generating good... proteins and then trying to discover what functions they might have uh, yeah. for unique and novel ones. Uh, but AI is now at the point where it's like, you want me to design one? Tell me what you want me to want it to do first. I'll make you a protein. And I'll reverse engineer the whole thing. So for that point, yeah. we should be able to pretty uh, quickly, I would assume, find the function of proteins uh, across, yeah, across the animal kingdom. We should be able to see what it interacts with without having to step into the laboratory. Yes, right. not take things apart. Um, and like right in line with all of this, there's also a group of papers that have been uh, that have been published in Nature Communications Biology and Nature Medicine about uh, what's called the All of Us program. It's run by the U.S. National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and it is a uh, an effort to create a genome database uh, and is actually trying to improve the way that uh, genomes and health uh, genome data is used to create better health profiles and treatment um, for all individuals and uh, is a huge effort to start to represent underrepresented groups. And in this group of papers that have been pu published, they have uh, published analyses up to, of up to 245,000 genomes that have been gathered by this All of Us program. And in it, there are about 275 million new genetic markers that hadn't been seen, and about 150 may be uh, have some kind of a role in type 2 diabetes. There are uh, gaps that are being filled, and uh, it, it's it's very it's pretty exciting. The program has received about 3.1 billion dollars to date, and. Uh, has been working since 2018 to get people to enroll and uh, allow their genomes to be sequenced. And they had about 100,000 genom genomes at first, and they've enrolled about 413,000 anonymized participants, and 46% are minority, racial, or ethnic group. UK Biobank, 88% are from white people. So uh, this is a huge repository giving uh, more information about people from different backgrounds and it can really change the way that we look at a various um, SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms or genetic markers and things that haven't been reported before that can really influence the way that treatments come about and are. Yeah. And, and UK Biobank is probably 88% white people because it's uh, based UK. in the UK. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, to be fair, uh, yeah, yeah, there, fair are, there are other databases that are uh, like based in uh, Asia, based in Africa, that are uh, grabbing more of uh, uh, distinct populations there. But the more more data, the better. However, I'm going to skip actually to I think my one of my near to the last stories because... Oh. Everything Jumping. that you just said sounds amazing, sounds positive, uh -huh. and sounds oh. great. Because we're we're living in uh, in a Western uh, democracies. Exactly. Uh, yeah. That are using this genomic information for the health industry. The question is: Is it okay to publish or or provide this information? to an authoritarian government. And, and, and more to the point, is it okay to publish Chinese research? So last week, the journal Molecular Genetics and Genomic Medicine retracted 18 papers from Chinese institutions because of ethical concerns. This is thanks to a bioinfo magician, bioinformatician. I don't know. <laughs> not if magician. I mean, they're not statistics magicians. Yeah, informatician. Inf inf info, ma info magician. I'm going to stick with info magician. 
Okay, sounds uh, good. Eve Morrow, who has been uh, pointing out studies that fail to get proper, free, and informed consent when collecting genetic samples, is sort of being credited with getting these 18 papers taken down. Uh, he's especially been focused on vulnerable populations in China. He raised questions about the now retracted papers back in 2021 and is, is, is saying that this appears to be the largest set of retractions ever over human rights issues. So the kind of the, the retraction notifications are kind of uh, basic, uh, citing inconsistencies between the consent documentation and the research reported. The authors uh, from China are kind of saying, hey, you shouldn't take it down because it's fine. But there's also, of course, a different standard of consent taking place, apparently. The, the research that was taken down largely focuses on genetic markers that can be used to identify individuals and distinguish ethnic groups. Most of the papers focused on minority groups such as the Uyghur, Tibetan, and Hui people that are subject to intense surveillance by the Chinese security apparatus and may have been pressured into cooperating with researchers. The lack of rigorous informed consent, though, also applies to the Han Chinese majority. This came up, I don't know if you recall, I was talking about a study. It was a, a that didn't have anything to do with genetic markers or anything like this. No, but we were we were talking about you know, paper mills, we were talking about uh, the pay, this, this is, pay to play. Yeah, but research. this is earlier. This is this we is talk- uh, this was a study uh, about uh, elder elder care homes in China, and they wanted to see uh, how they could affect health by reducing sodium by using a sodium substitute. Oh, I don't and remember. And so that one. this study was conducted on these elder home residents, and. In the study, the researchers suggested that some of their results may have been compromised by uh, subjects who had detected the lack of sodium in their food additives and their food and, and, and began adding salt themselves. <laughs> and the problem that was- with that is that's not the kind of thing that's hey, likely people. to occur if you have informed consent and people know that they're part of a research study. So right there in the paper, you had the researchers complaining that the subjects had figured out something was wrong with their food, right? The, and, and, and if you looked through, and I tried to go back and remember and look through the, the consent documents, and yeah. supposedly so there were, people were signing stuff, but what they cited was they had gotten approval from the municipality, from the Not region the government, governing. Yeah, yeah, they were like, oh no, the government said it was okay. This is what they kind of came back. And so this is sort of perhaps a problem with uh, conducting or publishing science from authoritarian governments is that if it involves humans, we we don't have the same ethical standards taking place that we assume are in, in the guardrails that we assume are in place. Uh, in, in Western research. I think that there is an interesting question there as well, not just uh, in, with re- respect to authoritarian governments where there may be separate ethical standards, but are also uh, corporations that uh, have ownership of data. There, mm-hmm. We know uh, in recent history as well, Facebook has used, uh, has used user data uh, to carry out studies about how and publish studies related to how people respond to certain stimuli, advertisements, whatever, um, without anybody saying that it was okay for Facebook to use their data or, you know, without, it's not anything that particularly could have physically harmed people, but in some cases, these were, uh, you know, advertisements bits of propaganda, other things that uh, may have influenced mental health or uh, other aspects of emotional, you know, emotional health. Um, Yeah. So I think as we move forward, there is a big question about global research and there is, I think it's not, I don't know. I think it's the scientific community's 
responsibility to have a conversation about that and for scientific journals to ensure that there is a standard a minimum standard of consent and ethics and the united states generally used to have really bad standards we didn't have mm. consent yeah. right no 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 they could surprise somebody by studying them right oh guess what you're you're a part of a study those those shocks that you received uh, they were we were we actually did them on purpose yeah, so you were actually and, on a very powerful psychedelic. You haven't gone crazy. You, you're we'll a spider. You how, we needed to <laughs> study you weird. without you knowing. Yeah, just so, finishing up this. But, uh, more yeah, but we've that, come up with we've come up with new standards that universities have to follow, institutions have to follow. There are, you know, committees that have to okay research. It's not perfect, but you know, yeah, go on. So the, the the other thing that they sort of noted in this is that they these studies have uh, the research teams themselves have sort of a unusually high proportion of investigators affiliated with police and justice systems, which when you say unusually high, that's like almost unheard of in the West to have uh, have a police department investigation department actually being part of research studies. Yeah. And the fact that the, a lot of these studies are focused on distinguishing ethnic groups, like, what do you mean distinguishing? Like, when we're talking about it, when we were talking about it, we're talking about adding more diversity to the profile so that we can study perhaps differentiation of disease in different, yeah. uh, in different genetic groups. What this seems to be based on is how do you identify? Because... You have an authoritarian government that is also a ethnic majority uh, in China. And so if they are concerned about something, uh, you know, it looks like the precursor to a genetic based ethnic uh, differentiation within their society. And it is. But they don't need to be publishing that. I mean, they could just be like, you know, why? It. Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah. hey, world, you know, look at this hand in our science research. Meanwhile, so, I mean, that's the the question is, any science can be any knowledge gained by the scientific method can be used to all sorts of purposes, right? Any, we hope that science will be the process will be will occur in the fairest way possible for the betterment of humanity but yeah we don't know and so how can how can we help move that forward yeah uh, it's a big question yeah. it's inter well, one of the interesting we can do question. Is stop publishing authoritarian research on humans what if there's a human involved I think like we have already complained too much about Chinese research and the quality of what's coming out of there. I don't. The past, I think but... It doesn't matter. I mean, just the quality, right? Quality and uh, the credibility. And... The credibility is 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 so heavily questionable uh, yeah. for for the research that I that I've been coming across that's coming out of China to begin with. But there are other places as well. So it's but not... it, for for publishing. Uh, companies who are publishing science in the Western world that has an ethical guardrail for human trials. You have to understand that any paper that you are accepting from an authoritarian government like China does not have those in place. And should you be publishing it? It's a question I don't think that they have been looking at. And to think... this, uh, yeah, philosophically, ethically, it's probably a very important question for the journals to be considering and uh, moving forward also uh, for them to be considering in uh, also the political aspect of, you know, how and if they're being used as tools for um, for certain political ends, you know, and yeah. Gary L says science is self-correcting and it is over time, but sometimes that takes a lot of time. Yeah. I mean, you look at what happened with the Alzheimer's hidden uh, mystery uh, protein thing, right? That, that might've put research off by 20 years because somebody forged data. 
but self-correcting. Self-correcting for 20 years later. Like, we want our science, and we want it now. And we don't want people messing around with it in between. Science is for everyone. Science, uh, you know. Even authoritarian governments. Come it on, is. I'm it's just for a everyone. Come on. It's for everyone. But that... <laughs> But these are good questions to to surface. Do you want to talk about bulls and balls? I like, I got a couple of stories about bulls and balls. Uh, first story is um, researchers. Let's see if I can get my, get my stories up here queued up for me. Researchers looking at uh, fertility in bulls. We're having uh, having fun trying to figure out how they could uh, determine uh, why certain bulls are more fertile or less fertile than others. And uh, in the reproduction of bulls and these bull markets in uh, in the EU, uh, these researchers have de- they, basically the the markets. They take semen from all the bulls like once or twice a week, and then they water it down a little bit and they gets it gets mixed up with others and they give it to females. And, you know, sometimes turns out that some of the bulls aren't really fertile, but they have created a system where it's just kind of usually they just expect them all to be fertile and when they're not fertile that costs the uh the ranchers money the the people who are uh trying to work in the sales of these of these bulls why yeah Did it mix? I, I don't know for the betterment of the the bulls of the the beef no because here's the thing no but okay but they do okay like, and so but what happens animal husbandry you want to be able to control like the genealogy so you don't get too closely related so how would you be able to control that if you don't even know what was in the secret sauce <laughs> what was in the sauce well uh the the researchers have discovered just this problem overall is that uh the the bulls some of the infertile ones slip through because of the way that the the reproductive process is managed and they don't show up during during conventional conventional ejaculate screening uh because the genes aren't necessarily in the sperm or the ejaculate themselves, but actually further back in the testes, in uh, the cells that create the gametes. And so the the researchers who just published their story in Nature Communications, they used the testicles epididymis and vas deferens from 118 bulls of reproductive age. They were not killed for the research, but these parts were used for the research. They biopsied them, got uh, the messenger RNA, the transcriptomes that were there, and then looked to see what genes were active in which tissues. They found a whole bunch of genes that were active and a lot of variants that are related to fertility are also conserved in human fertility. So this study itself is not necessarily trying to help make human male fertility better but you know they want to they want to help the the bull ranchers save money and have fewer infertile bulls uh if they can help through genetic screening methods that are a little bit better but because they have found a whole bunch of these bulls and it's a lot easier to get these parts from bulls to do this research than it is to get them from humans um you know, you, voluntary donors, they don't pop up all the time. Um, it's hard to compare. So what they've come up with, though, is a bunch of genes that are highly conserved in human males that may be uh, helpful to help infertility in human males um, and also save bull ranchers money. So this is the, this is the I guess, the point of this story, too, is that Instead of focusing on being uh, bull ranchers, they should have been 
Managing and, other parts. Yes, more closely. more closely. And so this brings me to uh, the next story of really, really balls. Um, it's hard to study the testes. We have organoids for all sorts of different tissues. We have testes for uh, we have testes for the liver. We have test uh, not testes, <laughs> organoids. <laughs> we have organoids. Margaret, this has been anatomy with Kiki. I, Hang on a second. I did great at anatomy. Okay. Anyway, uh, no wonder it hurts so much when I get kicked in the liver. Ah, oh, yes. Anyway, we have organoids for the liver, for the kidneys, for the brain. All sorts of organoids. We don't have any for the testes. And uh, so these researchers uh, out of um, out of uh, the Bar Ilan University have published their paper in uh, the International Journal of Biological Sciences towards the testes in a dish generation of mouse testicular organoids that recapitulate testes structure and expression profiles. So in this work, uh, they used rat neonatal testes first to see if they could take neonate testes and uh, get them to grow in a dish and Lo and behold, they did. And they said, okay, now we don't want to be taking uh, neonatal testes because a lot of the developmental issues that would be uh, influencing development of these reproductive organs would happen earlier. And so they took embryonic tissue to create organoids in addition. They were able to pretty much get organoids that grew within a dish structure. They could not get adult tissue to grow into a, 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 an organoid in a dish. Um, and the embryonic tissue, they were completely unable to get to produce sperm. So these, these tissues, these organoids are kind of working. They've been able to get the embryonic rat embryonic tissue to create organoids. They last for about nine weeks, but they don't create sperm, but they start kind of the process. So there's still some stuff that they haven't quite figured out on how to maintain and sustain these, uh, these testes in a dish and keep them working. We wouldn't even need the bulls. Right could be used if we could make testes in a dish so many things would change in the world would they i don't know but uh this system would be a great system and that's what they're publishing for is the model system to be able to create a laboratory process to enable the research into the uh, development and uh diseases and dysfunction related to uh the testicular reproductive tissue. So bulls and balls. Dun, dun, dun. Researchers so are having fun. If, if then I could, like, if I could, like, reproduce my testicles in a lab dish, <laughs> could they then survive? Like in a, in a what was it like head in a jar situation? Right. Just, man, the testicles could live on into the future. Or Your testicles, if you donated. No, actually, uh, I mean, they'd have to, at this point, like I said, the adult testicular tissue that they tried to use to make organoids did not create organoids they couldn't get it to work maybe at some point they will be able yeah. to do something like that but they, at this point they can't so it's uh embryonic tissue only at this point so that means that we're not at this stage going to be looking at human testy organoids yeah. it's going to be rat or other uh, animal organoids that uh, where that's more acceptable until they can figure out how to use human adult tissue to be able to 
make testies in a dish. It sounds like, you know, the, I don't know, what restaurant in New York City are you going to? Is that what you thought of? Yeah, my first thought was it, it would make, yeah. uh, it might make divorce court a little bit more uh, friendly. Like, well, we've negotiated. Uh, <laughs> we've decided that, uh, yes, <laughs> Miss Jackson, you, uh, you can have both of his testicles on a dish, oh, but dear. we're going to do uh, we're going to do it through science, not through, not through litigation. Not through castration at all. No. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Uh, Justin, do you want to talk about Denmark or Africa? Is it both? Yes. Oh, no, it's Denmark. Uh, I think is the next one. Uh, yes, oh. and. Yes, and a Danish bog body found in 1915 has begun to tell its life story. The remains are a few bones, fragmented skull, piece of wood, have been resting in the rural bog near the town of Vitrup for nearly 5,000 years before it was discovered. Now, research led by the University of Copenhagen has made a thorough assessment of the bones. The man, who is estimated to have been in his 30s when he died, using carbon and nitrogen isotope levels in bones and layers of teeth, researchers could reveal aspects of diet at different ages. So they found that he began as a fisher-hunter-gatherer in northern Scandinavian coastal regions, likely either along the Norwegian coast, possibly the Swedish coast, possibly as high up the Norwegian coast as the being an Arctic fisher. Then came a change in diet, one that was more dominated by resources from land and fresh water environments. Before the age of 18, 19 years old, he ended up among regular farmers, possibly within a culture that was common in Northwestern uh, Denmark and Jutland, where his life eventually ended. Violently. Probably uh, because violent. of the farmers that came around were like, we don't need you scavengers anymore. No more. Well, it sounds like he lived there for oh, maybe a couple of decades, a decade and a half amongst the farmers. Uh, but either he died violently either by ritual sacrifice, <laughs> because archaeologists just can't resist inventing ritualistic causes for human behavior. Uh, although there may also be other uh, other evidence of this being more common in those days or it could just been a mundane murder like you said like i don't like that farmer guy coming around foreigners either way the skull fragments <laughs> suggest at least eight blows to the head possibly derived by the wooden club also found with the remains uh, one thing that stands out from the current findings is the origin of the Vitrup man as being different from the known Danes in the region. Uh, everything from thickness of the skull to the isotopes, the things don't match the locals, but do have some ancient human remain correlations uh, uh, in Norway, possibly Sweden. Either way, uh, though, this is a... Uh, this. This person traveled to Denmark to have traveled across a hundred or so kilometers of open sea was actually a pretty small task for Vikings and their longboats. But Vidrup man made the crossing as a youth around 3000 years before even the earliest known signs of any boating in Scandinavia. Wow. This is 4,000 years before any truly seaworthy longboats were invented. So, are known to invent, and 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 the oldest known boats are only known because uh, they were not taken by the sea. The wood, uh, <laughs> right? So there there right. are oars and I guess some parts of a, a boat frame that have been discovered in another bog in Norway. Uh, that are the you know uh, I guess two thousand ish. Would they be two thousand ish years old? Uh, yeah, they must be. Uh, somewhere in that range. And it's about 4,000 years or 
a thousand years ago, there was a, a old boat that is that is found buried, like is a burial, right? Right, nine hundred A.D. ish boat construction that was buried in a mound. So these are the oldest boat remains that we have from Scandinavia. This huh. fella is three, four thousand years before all of that. And has traveled this great distance by sea, reinforcing that there is a gap in our historic maritime knowledge that might be kind of serious. Uh, an unwritten history of, of invention and migration by wooden craft that would be disintegrating beneath the waves of water and time thousands of years before any sort of physical trace can be found. Uh, and there are likely many more individuals like this around the world, right? Ahead yeah, you know, and there's... Ahead there's, of schedule, uh, right? Ahead of the, of the evidence. Yeah, like there's even whatever, uh, if it's, oh, Homo erectus, or de, de, uh, maybe it's a Denisovan, but the areas in, in, in Oceania that they've always looked at and gone, ah, there's no way somebody could swim that. Right. There's no, there's, there's ancient hominins on islands in, in the Aegean Sea even. Doesn't make sense how they could have gotten there. Well, it does if people have had boats for a really long time and we just assumed they didn't because we couldn't find any of the, the remains. This is a sort of interesting way of determining that. And you find a human who's like really far away from anywhere that they should be. And but, was beaten uh, really to close death. if you went by sea. <laughs> and beaten to death. Well, that helps too. Throw, if you're going to do a murder th and you want to get away with it, uh, don't put them in the bog. Not the bog. We're, we're going to find the evidence. Bogs are good at preservation, yeah. everybody. Dun dun. Dun dun. We, we concluded the investigation into the bog man. Tell me about ADHD then. Oh, you want to go to the third story? Okay, here we oh, go. Oh, do you here want to do that right now or did you want to save it for later? We can save it for later. We can do it either way. I'm happy either way. You're you want to do it now? You want to do it now? You want to do it now? Whatever, whatever. I got whatever. it right now. It's on the list. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> this is a neuroscientist and psychologist from the Perlman School of Medicine and the Indian Institute of Technology, suggesting that early hunter-gatherer groups may have benefited, benefited from the behavior of individuals with ADHD. They think these individuals were more likely to explore beyond known territories, leading to the discovery of new game to hunt or plants to eat. And he says, according to this, people with attention deficit hyperactive disorder tend to have more trouble focusing on activities around them. They may also exhibit restlessness and be easily distracted. What? Prior research suggests that the condition <laughs> is inherited and it may have been affecting humans for many, many, many thousands of years. In the study, researchers looked at genetic advantage or looked for the genetic advantages of ADHD. And they had experiments involving 457 volunteers playing a berry picking video game of some sort, hovering a cursor over a berry bush uh, for several seconds and moving the cursor as uh, to, to, you know, clicking on stuff, I guess, to harvest the berries. And then you got to wait for them to regenerate. But then you can also go around to other berries and then you got to hover the cursor over there for the berries to pick. It's one of those things that <sighs> sort of, it sounds like a uh, sunk cost what is it what is that called uh, sunk cost yeah, the sunk cost fallacy or the yeah yeah it's like, yeah, it's like when you when you choose a lane in traffic and then you're like that lane over there is going faster i'm gonna move over yeah or if you yeah. go well i took all the trouble of getting into this lane i'll just let it sort itself out or i'm at the at the grocery store and i've been in this lane so long i'll just stay here just gonna keep it yeah yeah, yeah. do it so apparently They've discovered that uh, the folks with the ADHD were much more likely to uh, ignore sunk cost fallacy and much more, more likely to do the lane change or the, the line change and switch to other bushes in this game to pick berries from. 
That would be me. And their strategy was successful. <laughs> they tended to collect more this way than the groups who were being more uh, conservative about it. I'm not surprised. I, I'm, I mean, there are... <sighs> okay. Evolutionary psychology... Uh, every time you get into these kinds of things, it's like, and we make it up a story based on what we see here in the now and blah, 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 blah. But the, the truth of it is a lot of the things, not all of the things, um, a lot of the things that are uh, present in our current day form, function, behavior are, are there because they were uh, useful in the past. So uh, how would ADHD be useful? Maybe, you know, people really great at like 80% finishing things. And then you're like, yeah, okay, time to move to the next thing. And you leave before you use up all the resources and, you yeah. know, get people to try something new. You know, maybe it was helpful in that way. And then you yeah. have the sociopaths and the psychopaths who are really good at like going and killing the other tribes, you know. Yeah. We called them uh, in the olden times, we called them kings. Yes. <laughs> now, now we call them CEOs. Now they call <laughs> CEOs and <laughs> world leaders. Yes. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, it's a, an interesting... Uh, I mean, the test is, hey, do you have ADHD? Um, and then uh, I mean, then they made up a story about why the restlessness would be beneficial uh, in the past. Well, it was an inter it's an interesting thing because uh, mm. just aside from them trying to connect it to early man and trying to like figure out what advantages there could be in resource gathering which is what right. they were trying to look at they were just trying to look at how did, how would this affect a simple version simplified version of resource gathering but what i thought was really fascinating is to me that makes adhd make so much more sense if people with adhd lack that uh the feeling of consequence of a, a sunk cost if, no, it's novelty. It's dopamine. Uh, you got to move on to the next thing. Get novelty. Maybe that's but that's, that's what's being yes. told all the time. It's but not. It's not possible. great for the the capitalistic culture that we are existing in currently, uh, but it's also great for you know being the kind of a creative, being an entrepreneur, maybe maybe being you know somebody who is uh, able to try new things, come up with great new ideas, uh, but. Yeah, but, and the, but, uh, there's the there's multiple sides to it, and multiple different uh, neurodivergences, and you know, so I'm, if there's no one type of uh, ADHD, there's huge okay. you know, spectrums. But that's all said. If there is a lack of sunk cost, uh, appreciation of that sunk cost, or feeling of that sunk cost fallacy that that I've already invested time in this idea or this project. And that you can uh, simply walk away from it without feeling like you've invested, uh, you're, you're, you're invested in this line and now you've already committed to it. You're like, no, actually, I could just walk anytime. I can move anytime. Then it sort of makes sense how people can go unfinished project onto something else, uh, unfinished thought, talk about something else. The lane changing uh, aspect, if you don't have that, or just idea. And when you talk about like in creatives and that sort of thing, here's the way that we all do it. And here's what you've been trained in school. Yeah, that's great. I got this other idea. I'm going to go try that. <laughs> like it could, a lot of it could just be not feeling uh, like you owe the line, anything that you owe that, that the, uh, no, because something else is more interesting over there or that one. Well, looks better. Or be like that, that I like that. One. I like that yeah. one better now. I'll go there but, now. Okay. But, but then the, human the, psychology is more complex than that. So you can't just say, you know, but yeah, maybe, maybe for some people you, that there is no sunk cost. Maybe there is no, no feeling yeah. of regret <laughs> or concern over the switch. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a I'd, tremendous amount of sense. People are different. They're very different than AI. Uh, uh, Are they? Is that that they were getting more and more similar? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. 
that's that's kind of what this study is coming. Uh, researchers, surprise, surprise, published in PNAS Nexus. Their their article: How persuasive is AI generated propaganda? It's persuasive. In their study, they used articles that had been identified as propagandist online in the past. They used chat GPT-3, trained it with the articles, uh, and they used very specific uh, researcher-written thesis statements that they fed to chat GPT for each of the, uh, for shorthand for the articles. And in doing that, then they got uh, a bunch of people to read articles that were then rewritten or created by chat GPT related to these topics and what had been fed to them by the researchers. Uh, and they determined that uh, the, the propaganda from the chat GPT was pretty much as good as or close to as good as the uh, original propaganda. And then when they uh, got people involved to kind of edit the propaganda, uh, then it got even better. So when people, mm -hmm. when, with, with editing, propaganda by AI is even more convincing. <laughs> so so it's, a, it's pretty amazing, everybody. AI, uh, maybe, maybe AI more than one. is good at, propaganda based on the propaganda that people have been giving it themselves for you know years and when humans try to make it better it gets better <laughs> who knew there are only two forms of intelligence there yeah, might be like 50 kinds of adhd fine fine whatever there's only kind two kinds of intelligence intelligence that is binary and intelligence that is not it looks like when they work together, they can make good propaganda. Hey, yo. All right. Anyway, yeah, who knew AI could possibly be used by people for particular propagandist aims? Woo! This is This Week in Science. Thank you for joining us for this week's show. It's so exciting to have Justin back on the show today. We are going to finish up fairly soon here, but before we do, I have... I have our last stories. Um, I just want to say thanks. And if you are enjoying the show, please share This Week in Science with a friend and head over to twist.org if you are interested in seeing our show notes and other stuff related to past episodes. We also have ways for you to support the show. So if you click on the Zazzle link, you can buy merchandise that is twists related and the royalties go back to help keep, keep the show going. Uh, there's a lot of art related uh, content, not content, they're products that Blair made. And then there's a calendar. If you, you know, it's February. Oh my goodness. But there's a calendar that Blair made. If you want to get a calendar from Zazzle for this week in science and also our Patreon is at twist.org. You can click on that Patreon link and become a, a supporter in an ongoing fashion, uh, monthly, choose your amount, $10 and more a month. And we will thank you by name at the end of the show. We can't do it without you. So thank you very much for your support. We're going to come back right now and talk about a few more little science items. I'm going to jump into a, a story about brains because you know how much I love the brains. So let's talk about how none of us would be here running around, talking, discussing, doing anything that we do if it weren't for a virus. Really, oh, truly, oh, uh, we are uh, the product of a virus that infected uh, our lineage at a time way back when it was called a retrovirus, a uh, endogenous retrovirus. There are a number of them. They're called the ERVs. And the ERV ones are uh, involved in uh, a lot of aspects of, of uh, our genetics. This particular study that was just published in Cell 
It's called a retroviral link to vertebrate myel myelination through retrotransposon RNA mediated control of myelin gene expression. Blah, 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 blah. What does that mean? A long, long time ago, a virus that goes back, it goes into the DNA to get itself locked into the DNA. So then our cell DNA transcribes it so that then it can take over cells and do things. It tried to do that, but then it got involved in the process of, of making our, uh, making our nerves work, which is, I think one of the most exciting aspects of this myelin is responsible for the ability of our nerves to send rapid signals down their lengths, down the axons, uh, from our heads all the way to our feet. Uh, and in this, uh, myelin is really essential to the fast action that we have, the fast responses that we have. And this study, they uh, discovered this endogenous retrovirus that they have named um that they have named retromyelin very very flashy name retromyelin is found in a lot of different species a lot of different groups of vertebrates they found them in fish in amphibians they have found them in jawed vertebrate species they uh, found them all over the place and so they're like okay all right retrotransposons these are really interesting these they're known to be a huge part of our genome but for this aspect of uh, our genome to be uh, so important to such a, uh, an aspect of our ability to function is one of the most exciting, interesting aspects. Second, they did a, a sequencing and phylogeny comparison. So they started looking at retromyelin in a number of different species. They determined that it wasn't one infection that was just carried through all of us. It's This is convergent evolution. This is a number of different infections. So one of our common ancestors was infected, and then maybe we got infected again later. This retro transposon, retromyelin, whatever it is for us as people, is very slightly different than... Uh, the one in birds. It's very slightly different from the one in reptiles. They're not the same. Yeah, so it's evolved separately. It is in fact this virus that, that allows a cellular process to take place that creates an oligodendrocyte that wraps around our nerve cells and in a certain way to allow efficient nerve impulse, action potential transmission to take place, it's happened multiple different times in different species. It's not just once. But, and so but, we have like these really, really but, tight wrappings that make our axons, our myelin, really efficient versus other species that don't. So it's different. But like how, how is that possible? I don't know. It's, this is so exciting to me. <laughs> Yep. Yep. So uh, jawed vertebrates, jawless vertebrates, invertebrate species, we've got all over the place. Um, and there's this incorporation has occurred over and over and over again. And when they uh, tried to take it out, you know, through genetic modification, uh, it, the oligodendrocytes just didn't function. They didn't make myelin. It didn't happen the way it was supposed to. So it's this retromyelin, this endogenous retrovirus, this very specific uh, derived element is essential. So but it's, it's essential across the board and differently. Okay. So it's here's wild. the question then. Because, yeah. because first of all, that's not possible. But what else? Did okay, so the hang on, hang on, okay. hang on. 
<laughs> Hang on. How do you know? Deep breath. Deep breath. It's not possible because uh, the way evolution works, that it wouldn't have uh, shown up in a later species or a different branch of a species and, and not had been there before. However, what we then might be looking at is it could be replacement. Like, like you get a, like there's a, uh, right? Like, a, oh, we found a better wrapping virus and it comes in and takes over the job. Is that, is that what we must be talking about? Right. I, so this is a question that the researchers ask themselves and, uh, you know, they say, Hey, we know this is, this is wild, right? Uh, yeah. th this co-option that, that it, that it occurred over and over again in this convergent evolution way, each host was separate and adapted, um, separately, uh, and that, yeah, they they explored the different species, but they they you know they they do say okay, we don't know. Uh, there are limitations to what we've looked at. Uh, yeah. All we've really looked at are molecular relationships. Uh, there's you know specific requirements, um, and we've just uh, found jawed vertebrates. I mean, I'm looking through the discussion right now, but um, yeah, well, one, the, of the, one of the other, the other things that then pops in my mind is like, okay, if it didn't actually happen multiple times, the yeah, alternative the, is that a virus was incorporated very early and viruses, the viral DNA is just our DNA. We're not looking at something separate and outside of, that's joining the game. It's it's like no, some of the essential building blocks of life, intelligent life on, on planet Earth, or cellular functioning yeah. life on Earth. Like all oh, like life on Earth is yeah, it's it's virus based. Yeah. So they they say you know there is possible you know multiple mapping there might be ambiguity there's pro possible challenges with uh, specifically determining specific genomic location within long sequence reads there's you know what loci is it is it found in um, multiple mapping is possibly there there's evolutionary. Uh, time uh, evolutionary time so like younger sequences versus older sequences and how do you you know pinpoint that kind of stuff so there's more work that needs to be done for sure but and they acknowledge that but i love you know they're like hey this is what we found and this is yeah. what it looks like so it's like this is a challenge now i think for <laughs> for researchers to either confirm or because it yeah because it's obviously n not how uh, it could have happened like there's just not over and over and over again well Why? i mean like, like the thing is it would be like it would be like cellular function was not taking place in several species until like no that's not one of the that's not one of the possibilities that's not one of the options that can't be yeah and I why think. is it a very specific interplay between this retromyelin mm -hmm. gene and it's uh it's all of its variants um and very specific other molecules within pathways within our nervous system and also other ver vertebrate species nervous systems um you know why does it work in the way that it does so yeah i don't know we'll see where it goes why was it co-opted? How did this happen? Is this is this real? Is this even real? Yeah. Is this even real? Well, I mean, in the in the genome that we think of as the blueprint, we've also since discovered it's not so much a blueprint. It's not so much instructions. It's just raw ingredients. It's a list of ingredients. It's a list of the building materials that the the life form can use. And so if that building material was sourced at some point from a virus, it makes no difference. It's a building material now and we're going to use it however we need to. For sure. Rather, but if that system. if that it's like though, you know, with our computers we need very specific, you know, USB C now versus just regular USB or lightning or, you know, whatever the standards or the differences, you know, whatever is being used at a particular time. And it's kind of like 
this retromyelin fit along the way, right? As the standard changed species, the infection changed and it was still able to fit in the right place to influence myelin. And this is the yeah. question of how is that, how did that happen? Yeah, yeah the likelihood. I, I don't know. I want more people to study it. That's why I, I want, mm -hmm. I, I think it's so fascinating. Let's talk about it, everybody. Uh, my last study, though, is about uh, music in the brain. And we've talked about uh, music and appreciating music before. Uh, and this group out of UC San Francisco has studied the way that the brain responds to speech and phonemes and um, uh, found that there are very specific neural groups, neurons also, that respond specifically to certain phonemes, which are set like, and What's pitch phoneme? changes. It's uh -huh. certain sounds in speech. Hmm. Um, and this time around, the researchers were like, okay, so let's turn it not just from speech to music. So not just understanding speech and appreciating speech, but music itself. And uh, they found that just like with speech, there are specific uh, neurons that are listening to the pitch, to the melody, and making predictions. And there are some of these neurons that are very similar or the same as what are used in uh, listening to speech. But there is a specific population of neurons that is predicting predicting how the melody is going to change or the pitch is going to change. And that is a very, very specific set of neurons in the brain that do that. And so this may be not just a uh, part of how we appreciate music or how we, you know, when you, you wait for that kind of like completion, you know, if something goes from a major chord to the minor chord, and then you want it to come back to the major chord or to like, you know, to, to like finish with a, a nice, in a nice way, you want completion. We've and learned it's, and it's some, of, some of that, of course, is going to be training, uh, yes. right? Because uh, depending on what kind of music you've, you've heard, you have a different expectation of what should, what should be next. And then that becomes your taste in music or the flavor of, you, of music that you flavor. Sound of music that you the, like. The Sound of Music, that was a movie with Julie Andrews. Anyway, uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty it's pretty interesting, These uh, the researchers being able to uh, look at the brain and using uh, people who were undergoing uh, surgery for epilepsy, uh, had them listen to Western music, modern Western music, a uh, bunch of different things, and then recorded with uh, electrodes like on the surface of the human auditory cortex. Uh, and were able to see how the melody was encoded as the music was played. And and they were able to see that different neurons were more or less uh, excited or stimulated by the changes in note, by the changes in pitch. Uh, and those were all involved in, uh, in the way that the hearing and the appreciation is a, occurred. Um, they moved beyond just talking in sentences, they looked at music. I think this is very fascinating because there is, uh, I don't know, I think there's something to be said for the way that people speak and the tone and the pitch. Like if you listen to Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, the way he starts and the way he starts with a slow and kind of low but major chord of his voice. And then it starts to increase and the pitch changes and the tempo changes and he brings you along almost in a musical way 
until he comes to the completion. And it's like the great speeches and the great orators in our human history use the musicality of our voices. And I think, you know, I, I think there's a definite like uh, relation between, you know, our understanding of speech and our appreciation of music. Also the whole repeated uh, phrase thing. Yes. Like if oh, the brain has, yeah. if the brain has an expectation that they're going to hear it again and then it's fulfilled, it also tends to ring, uh, ring truer. If you, yeah. if you, if the brain is predicting what's going to be said and then it's said, you're like, ah, I knew it. That yeah. sounds right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, our well, brain isn't answer... just looking for notes. It's actually like going, hey, I think I know what's going to come next. And is it going to happen? Is the melody going to happen this way? Kind of interesting if they, uh, I would like to see what happens if they, when it, when it was like, you know, they were given like a, a classic country song, you know, like <laughs> what goes up must come down, what goes around, tuna fish. <laughs> <laughs> and to see, like, if the brain's like, what, what happens mm -hmm. when the prediction can't come true? When the prediction isn't, doesn't fit? Does the, there's the brain like, oh, there's, there's like looking back at, wait, you said down over here, and now you're over, came back to tuna fish. That's, that doesn't sound right at all. That does, what are you doing? What happens to the predictive ability of the brain then? <laughs> Yeah, there are lots of studies like that, though, where they, uh, but usually they're vis visual auditory connections where they have, oh, it's a red square and somebody says the word green. And, mm -hmm. you know, and so it right. asks you to try and figure out the difference between. So there's a bunch of work that's been done in those kinds of, you know, how the brain differentiates between these sensory inputs. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, in this case, uh, as we well know, our brain is a predictive instrument and it's doing abstract processing with very specific neurons that are predicting music and melody, melody and meaning for emotion. It's great. Hmm. Do you have one more story or do you have to go? Oh no. Uh, this is a, this is a story about how I got absolutely and completely gazeboed the other night. Oh my goodness. Why do you keep saying Oof. gazeboed? Gaze that's not even a thing. No, but uh, uh, you could probably tell what I was talking about. Um, <laughs> it's questionable. I don't know. Okay. What mm -hmm. if I what if I said uh plastered, blasted, loaded, schnuckered? Those are kind of Western Americanisms, yeah. How about schnuck, schnooked, schnuckered? Isn't that a pool Schnuck. phrase? No, I don't know. Pissed, hammered, wasted. Basically, what happened was uh, some German linguistic uh, professors looked at the way that uh, Americans talk about getting drunk, and they figured out that basically by the time a youth uh, in America is is coming to adulthood adulthood they've heard references to getting drunk ending in an ed so many times that if you if somebody says oh, i got totally pajama the other night it doesn't matter what you say it's just as long as it ends <laughs> in ed it means drunk oh no it's is so this, is, is this what... is so prolific in the united states it's not just but the United use... States, but, no, <laughs> but, no, no. but I'm, but, I'm glad this but, is that that now what they can, you know, how the Germans can see us, you know, oh, the, the drunkards. <laughs> but can you, can you, can you like think of all the different ways? I get so American. Because uh, what was it? Was it that partial list right there? It was just like uh, wasted, blasted, uh, hammered, car parked, fist. car parked. Is that one? I, yeah, car parked. <laughs> I never heard of that. Was car park. <laughs> I totally car parked last night. Oh my goodness. Fudded? Oh, I got totally fudded. Right? Like all of this, like every, it's like universally, like it ended in ED and therefore it meant, it meant drunkenness. Anyway. And I, I really not love a whole this lot though. More the, but the, the word though is that there is, it's not a synonym 
It's a drunken nym. Drunken nym. Drunken nims. How many drunken nims can you name in the next 30 seconds? The loser has to take a shot. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, that was all that story I had. Well, thanks for the uh, the the drunkenness. Schnookered, right? Okay, totally like schnookered. The... Schnookered, I think, means you got fooled. Right? right? Wait, isn't, isn't, that's what I thought. Isn't that like a pool term or something? Yeah. Ah, Schnago. I'm gonna get so scienced. That would be fermented. Uh... Anyway, <sighs> maybe that's where it all started for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the uh, the abstract right now, and I'm going to share it on screen for our uh, video viewers because they share a quote at the bottom of their abstract. Obviously, Americans, like many other peoples of the world, have taken being drunk very seriously. <laughs> Harry Jean <laughs> Levine, 1981. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So, so America was uh, uh, one one uh, thing that almost lost the Revolutionary War, the fight against the British. George Washington's troops almost abandoned uh, serving because there was a daily ration of gin uh, oh, that had boy. that they they couldn't provide anymore. They ran out. And they they switched it to whiskey. And the troops were like, okay, but we need a little bit more because that's not what we were expecting. But they had, a, <laughs> they had a daily booze ration. And that booze ration, if you look at it, was like, I've met a few alcoholics in my day. Hey. And even, even they would have looked at the amount of booze being drunk by the average American soldier in the Revolutionary War and gone, geez, that's, that's a little excessive. <laughs> oh my gosh, some of these are okay. So, here are some st synonyms. Uh, BBC Culture article uh, by Dent in 2017 states there are 3,000 words English currently holds for the state of being drunk, including ram squaddled, obfuscated, tight as a tick, and the curious been too free with Sir Richard. <laughs> This is a fun, this is a very fun study. Uh, thanks, linguists from Germany. Yeah, at certain points in time, uh, booze was safer than water. In a way, yeah. Oh, yeah, you know, good point. It's the only, only way to, only way to keep, uh, your, keep the dysentery away from the troops. <laughs> to drink booze instead of water. We'll we'll worry about marching in a straight line later. We're not going to spend too much time. Oh, maybe that's why they spent so much time actually practicing marching. <laughs> that's probably why. It's like they weren't just practicing like being a uniform group. They were like, oh no, all right. We get, when we get out there, you're going to be able. To, you're going to have to be able to walk together. Straight this line <laughs> with this much booze on the, in your belly. No. Oh god, splonkered. Yes, dogged. I love all yeah, these. In words. fact, when uh, when, uh, when that famous Negative. painting of of, uh, of George Washington crossing the Delaware, you know, <sighs> to go invade the fort, whatever it was over there in uh, Washington D.C. or wherever that takes takes place. Uh, yeah, once upon a time. Delaware is that the D.C.? I don't even know. Uh, they they took the fort from the pos the position from the from the British because they showed up after some holiday. And the British were all passed out. So that's a that noble like look of going across the raft and uh, to, to do the invasion. I'm sure everybody was was unconscious from dr over drinking. <sighs> that's the everybody best, was and that's they the just best time like, to attack. Yeah. Hey, we uh, uh, you guys were sleeping, but uh, we just won the big battle. What big battle? Oh, the one. Where... Oh, there's no battle anymore. You all were sleeping. Okay. We took over. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Oh, oh, back man. to your quarters. Right. We're in well, charge we'll now. We'll next time. Okay. Uh, I hope we catch everybody <laughs> here next time. Yeah. Yeah. We've made it to the end of another great show, yeah? Yeah. Oh, good. Well, everyone, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for listening. And we really hope that you enjoyed the show. I have shout-outs. 
to our chat rooms, everyone who is here chatting during the show. Thank you for your comments and uh, your statements and your questions and your little side battles taking place in various places, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, Discord, all these places. I see you. Fada, thank you so much for your help with show notes and social media, getting all the word out about This Week in Science and the stories that we cover. Gord, Arn Lore, other people involved. Thank you for helping to make sure our chat rooms are pleasant places to hang out for all the peoples. Identity 4, thank you for recording the show. And Rachel, thank you for editing the show. And as always, I definitely could not go on without thanking our Patreon sponsors. So thank you to Aaron Anathema, Arthur Kepler, Craig Potts, Mary Gertz, Teresa Smith, Richard Badge, Bob Cole, Kent Northcote, George Chorus, Pierre Velazar, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Chris Wozniak. Vagard Chefstad, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Regan, Shubru, Sarah Forfar, Don Mundus, B.I.G., Stephen Alberon, Daryl, My Shack, Andrew Swanson, Fredos 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles Jack, Ryan Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Flo, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Z. McKen, Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard, Brendan Minnis, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, G. Burton, Lattimore. Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, Lon Make, CEO, Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthan, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul D. Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick, Patrick Pecoraro, and Tony Steele. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And for anyone out there who would like to join us as a Patreon sponsor, please head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. On next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, 5 a.m. Thursday, Central European time, something like this. <laughs> Whatever you are, know, whatever time. I don't know. It's two yeah. shows, but somehow we get them done at the same time. I don't know. No, it's really one show, same time, topics. different time zones. Oh, my goodness. Want to listen to us as a podcast? I hope you do. Search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. And if you enjoyed the show, please get your friends to subscribe too. Like, really, like, take their mobile devices or whatever with their podcast apps and be like this and subscribe them. That would be awesome. But I'm not telling you what to do because no, I'm not going to do that. For uh, <laughs> more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes, links to stories, and instructions on how to add us to your friend's device are available on our website, www.twist.org, where you can also sign up to get a newsletter. But it won't yeah. be from us. Yeah, yeah. From us? It'll be, it's from us. Of course it's it is. Oh. Yeah. And you can also contact us directly through the emails. Yes, I know. The old communication technology. Email me at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. Justin is twistminion at gmail.com. Blair's Blairbaz at twist.org. And if you do email us, make sure you put twist somewhere in the subject line so that your email doesn't get Bam filtered into, I don't know, um, propagandist AI or I don't know, Saturn, where it's just stuck on the surface of Titan and nobody's really finding it anymore. So, yeah, don't do that. Twist, subject line. Yeah. You can also hit us up on other social media where you can find at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. Yeah. Hashtag sonnets for science. And we will be back here next week, as you know, and we hope that you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show... Remember, it's all in your head with a virus. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 
This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way So everybody listen To what I say I use the scientific method For all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion All over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science This week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science.